I'm going to just speak for you know a little bit of time, and I'll tell maybe four different. I have four different pieces of this presentation. Um, I give you the names of the pieces in case you want to keep a track. Uh, they are condition, facts, politics, and anachronism. Now it's interesting that the last one is anachronism for a talk whose name is the necessity of communism. So just uh, get ready for anachronism. Condition. You know, before we met, I was uh, in Delhi working as a journalist. And there were two landmark events uh, that struck me at that time. I mean, of course, perhaps personally for me, the most important event was the anti-Sikh riot of 1984 when uh, 3,000 Sikhs were killed, massacred, butchered really in Delhi over a weekend. Uh, that was a very monumental uh, part of my life. And uh, I really li would like you to see my, uh, my cousin sister's film called Amu. Uh, it's a terrific film. We were both deeply marked by that uh, pogrom. And my first book actually was about the killers, as it were. I went to study the so-called killers of uh, the Sikhs in 1984 uh, in Delhi. And then I discovered that the story is more complicated. But in the early 90s, there were two incidents that really marked uh, my understanding of what was happening in India. Of course, there was the collapse of the Soviet Union. But inside India, one was that Manmohan Singh in Bangkok decided to announce that India was going to the IMF. You might remember that he made the announcement in Bangkok. and. We all, the people who were reading the uh, press releases, discovered that all the spellings were American. And we thought, you know, well, obviously this document is written by some Yank and, you know, faxed to Manmohan Singh and he read it out. Because, you know, there was C-O-L-O-R. I don't know why color was in there, but I'm just giving that example. Maybe there were flavor. I don't know what, but they were all American spellings. So that was interesting. India going to the IMF. You may not remember that India actually airlifted gold to the Bank of London, physically lifted gold. I mean, think of the vulgarity of this. You know, there is no England. It's a petty, useless little island. You know, if not from the wealth that it stole from not only South Asia, but of course the Caribbean and, you know, from uh, enslavement of African people. And, you know, this pathetic little island, if it hadn't stolen all this from the world, it would never have had the kind of wealth that it had. I mean, there's no way they would have had an industrial revolution without the value that it had extracted from the bodies of enslaved people and mines in which Amerindians in Potosi and so on, you know, uh, worked basically for free for Britain, for John Bull, for Queen Victoria, so that they could give us famines, so they could destroy our way of life and so on. And yet, when India had a balance of payments shortfall in July of 1991, gold had to be sent to England so that India could get a bridge loan. That struck me as the continuation of colonialism. You know, whatever people say, there was something obscene about that. Soviet Union might have collapsed, but this obscenity of capitalism was still front and center a problem. The second thing that occurred was in Silampur in 93. I was, again, a young journalist covering um, the riots of Silampur after the destruction of the Babri Masjid on December 6th, 1992. And in Silampur, there was a curfew because there, there was basically massacre of Muslims taking place. And during the curfew, I hid in a temple uh, one of the nights. And a few, maybe an hour after I was in the temple, there was a big banging on the door, and this group of killers came in. And it struck me as they looked kind of ordinary. You know, they had their machetes, their knives, and they smelled of sort of sweat, and I guess the smell of human blood. And we had to all sleep in the same place together. Well, a few hours later, there was another knock on the door. Now, remember, it's a shoot-at-sight curfew. And if you know anything about the Indian, you know, constabulary, including the border security force, which was out around Delhi at that time, that they take this damn shoot at sight order seriously. So there was an old woman at the door, and she handed a small packet to one of these men, and he handed it to the leader, who was quite a mastan type guy, you know, he was like a wrestler, real bold, tough looking guy. Well, it was his mother. 
and she had delivered this package for him. Well, he takes the package and he opens it and he takes out the stuff and then he shoots himself in the veins and of course it's his heroin. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is wrong. I mean, these are people who've just massacred other people and he's a heroin addict. There is something deeply wrong in our civilization. There is something deeply wrong in a civilization committed increasingly to social labor and private accumulation. It was obvious that India was going to get much more unequal when all the different, you know, however pathetic those social welfare programs were, as they were all getting dismantled, you knew that there was going to be a serious crisis in the country. You know that capitalism is intelligent, that it tries to conceal from the masses of people this contradiction between social labor and private accumulation. You know that increasingly intellectuals are going to move from being intellectuals of the good side of history to being intellectuals on the bad side of history. That they're going to be out there doing at least two things. One, they become intellectuals of capitalism, finding new ways to get people to work harder, to work less. You know, whether it's people who work on, you know, tailorism, things like that, but also finance, intellectuals of finance, trying to squeeze more out of people's, you know, inability to create a livelihood. But then there's a second set of intellectuals who create desire, aspirations, advertising people. You know, these are also intellectuals who come in and create a new cultural universe. More people entering the private media landscape. This was already clear to us in the news media. I started off as a news reporter for New Delhi Television. Then it was called The World This Week. I had really super colleagues. You might know some of them. One of them was mentioned earlier, Rajdeep Sardesai. It was a small office. And then, of course, the great genius and one of the most intelligent Indians who's ever been born, Arnab Goswami. So, you know, we were a very small office, and there was, you know, Chief Minister Arnab, who had already become an expert in terrorism. He had written a book which he used to try to flog to us every day. Uh, you know, you already knew that something terrible was going to happen in the media landscape, that a construction of an immense falsity of desire was going to take place, and there was going to be an exercise of concealing from the masses the reality of social labor and private accumulation. This is a degeneracy that was creeping into society, and it was quite clear that this new intellectual class, including this new political class, people like Lal Krishna Advani, who, you know, now, sorry, like George W. Bush is getting rehabilitated, but Lal Krishna Advani was a venomous character, hateful man. You know, these are the intellectuals who orchestrated the idea of scapegoating in, in society. This is not a new idea for places like India, but the velocity of scapegoating was going to intensify. This was very clear to us. Part one, conditions. Part two, facts. There are 1.3 billion people roughly in India. According to a McKinsey study, 700 million of them go hungry every day, or at least don't know when their next meal is coming from. That's about one in two Indians, roughly. 300 million Indians, very conservative number, wouldn't be able to read that McKinsey report. 240 million Indians wouldn't be able to read that report at night because they don't have electricity. And stunningly, one million Indians enter the sewers of the country every year to clear them manually, despite the fact that there is equipment to do this work. One million Indians. There are more poor people in India than in the entirety of sub-Saharan Africa. India is one of the poorest places on the planet Earth. There are also millionaires. There are also nuclear bombs. There's also Narendra Modi. Now, a hundred years ago, I think last week, Gandhi, okay, Gandhi, here I am, you know, I don't know, what's the name for me now? Let's Orthodox Marxist or vulgar, whatever. These are all nice names. Vulgar is fine, actually. I, don't, I actually like vulgar. Vulgarity has a certain nice ring to it, you see, because you can be honest then. Gandhi, about 100 years ago, said something quite beautiful in Muir College in Pune. He said, the test of civilization of a country is not the number of millionaires it has, but the absence of starvation among its people. Now, 100 years later, it's clear 
India has failed this moral test. It's a very elegant, simple test. India has totally failed. Part two, facts. Part three, politics. See, I'm going quickly. But the thing is, part three is long, so. <laughs> and I'm making some of it up as I go along. I'm looking down, but some of it I'm making up. So let's see. Politics. Um, by the 1970s, yes, it's, it is made up, so it's OK. Yes, the fact section is all made up. Uh, there's a sort of Borgesian thing. You can decide what's true or not. Uh, it's fake news. Yeah, that's right. 240 million Indians can't read. That's fake news. By the 1970s or maybe the 1980s, Indian freedom struggle, its reservoirs, had depleted themselves. I mean, there was an exhaustion to Indian freedom struggles. I mean, for me, a good indicator of that is the Planning Commission meeting in, I think, 1985, when uh, Rajiv Gandhi goes in as you know, the, t the head of the Planning Commission, even though uh, prime ministers rarely came in and, and, and ran the commission meetings. Manmohan Singh was then the actual chair of the commission. Rajiv Gandhi comes into a 1985 Planning Commission meeting and says, why are you bothering about farmers and support prices and all this crap? Rajiv Gandhi used to talk like that. Why are you bothering with all this crap, he says. You know, you need to think about building American-style freeways. We need to have better airports. We need to have malls. Why aren't you guys thinking about malls? You know, which is interesting, because they were thinking about the opposite of malls. How to protect agricultural farmlands, what's happening to farmers' livelihoods, things like that. Now, whether, again, they did anything useful with those discussions or not, the point is that was their discussion. This guy comes along and says, that's all boring. Let's think about becoming America. National liberation was really exhausted by then. There was a constituency among the so-called middle class. The word middle class inserted itself in place of the dominant classes. Because the word middle class can mean anything. What they really meant was the dominant classes in society were interested in transforming the kind of class compact that had been won through the national movement. And so what you see after 1985 is the surrender of the Indian National Congress. Already by the emergency period, Inder Gujral had come before the emergency parliament and said that we need to attract foreign exchange, we need to cut license raj. I mean, this was Inder Gujral, very fine man, very distinguished person, but he was saying this stuff in the emergency parliament in 1976. It didn't happen until... 1990-91. Slowly in the 80s they were doing some things, but in 1991 it's a decisive break. You see the surrender of the Congress party and slowly from 91 to the present, those old socialistic Gandhian sections of the party got marginalized or left. You know, they went to other places including some sections went to initially the BJP. The Samajwadi dynamic, the old socialist dynamic also begins to lose steam. And you begin to see, you know, whether it's the Samajwadi party or the, this Janta party or that Janta party or this Lok Dal, that Lok Dal, Lalu Prasad here, Mulayam Singh there. One way or the other, they began to collaborate fundamentally with the regional bourgeoisie. I mean, the fact that we used to call the Samajwadi party in UP the party of Rashtra Sahara is not, uh, you know, an idle comment. I mean, the Sahara group basically were the underwriters of Mulayam Singh Yadav's party in Uttar Pradesh. So there was a general surrender, in a sense, of the bulk of the political class, including some of the regional political parties, to this new policy dispensation. This policy dispensation, which favored the trajectory of malls and airports rather than support prices and, let's say, you know, some forms of protection for the poor. Now, this was itself very difficult for any political movement that wanted to chart an alternative. You know, those terms from the 1990s, from in 96, for instance, of the Third Front, United Front, Popular Front, if you draw the earlier terms, these were all terms with very limited content. Who is going to join your Third Front? Who is going to join your United Front? Who is going to come to you? These are questions that I'm going to return to in a second. If everybody else has gone in the other direction, how are you going to be able to create a national popular will to move the agenda in a different way? The left was put on the back foot by the mid-1990s. 
And this comes to that Im Im very important vote in 1996 made by my party, the CPIM, in our central committee. When the opposition groups came to Jyoti Basu, very venerable leader of our movement, and said, will you become the prime minister of the country? And our central committee had a very long meeting and decided at the end of it that no, Jyoti Basu cannot become the prime minister because he'll merely become the prime minister of a government with a completely different political direction. It's going to go in a completely different political direction. In fact, that government didn't last very long because there was just not enough political power. And there was no alternative national popular will that Jyoti Basu could have uh, driven forward into a different direction, broken India into a different policy direction. There was simply not the will. In this period, as we see this surrender of every political party, including the Congress, especially the Congress, to this policy direction which increased inequality, which brought a great deal of agrarian suffering, at the same time, you see the emergence, rapid emergence, of the fascistic RSS and its political party, the BJP. Rapid ascension. You know, and the ascension came on that one empty category. That's, the, in a sense, the genius of the BJP's national political emergence on that empty category, corruption. You see, corruption is an interesting category because it will produce the tweedledee, tweedledum politics. Every bourgeois party, when it's out of power, will accuse the one in power of corruption. And then you can just go back and forth and say they are corrupt. And, you know, you'll create a consensus where people forget that both are corrupt. And you say they are more corrupt because the scandals are more recent. You see, because that scandal with Adani happened yesterday. And then when you come to power, you'll have your own scandal. And then you'll delegitimize yourself and then you can come back. This corruption word produces a consensus of one party rule, essentially. With the difference in India that one party has this fascistic brain, the RSS, pushing it in a horrible direction. So what is the left to do? Now... I mean, I'm very glad we're meeting here not immediately after our defeat in Tripura. Because if we did, you'll just pile on to me and say, you guys are useless, you should close down. I'm going to come down to the, you should close down shop. Between the defeat in Tripura and now, other things have appeared, which have, by the way, always been there. You might not know that in September 2016, 180, 80, 180 million Indian workers went on strike in September 2016. 180 million workers. My friends, what is the population of Canada? Huh? How much? How many? How many again? What was that? How many times do we have to say that to come to 160 million? Six times. Well done. 160 million. How did they go on strike? I'm going to come back to that in a minute. That was in September of 2016. You know, the left hasn't done anything. The left hasn't done. Left doesn't do this. Left. We'll come back to that. Between the defeat in Tripura and now, we've had two major struggles, which I'd just like to point out. And I'd like you to go and do what every self-respecting person seems to do these days: go and Google it. Number one is the struggle in Sikkar, Rajasthan. I'd like you to go and look and watch the news click reports on the struggle in Sikkar, Rajasthan. I mean, these are very impressive uh, agrarian workers' struggles. The other thing is, go and Google Kisan Long March, the march in Maharashtra, which was led by the All India Kisan Sabha. You know, this was an amazing march, guys. You know, they marched 160 kilometers, uh, and they arrived in Bombay, and they heard, the leadership heard that there were class 10 exams the next day, so they kept marching through the night so they wouldn't disturb the students when they had their examinations. I mean, these are moral, upright people. And they forced the BJP government, horrible government, to accept their demands. You know, this is also Indian communism. And I'd like to talk a little bit with that in mind. So I have some questions that I'm raising. I think there are three, four of them that I hope you find useful in the broad section now is called anachronisms. What should the left do? The left exists, by the way. Um, I've been a member of the CPIM for now almost 30 years. Uh, we have a million CADA members. That's one million people in our party. We have about 80 million people in our mass movements, uh, including 14 million in the All India Women's Democratic Association, about 12 to 15 million in the All India Kisan Sabha. I mean, these are very large organizations. 
It's impossible just to say, oh, you know, I don't know, what would be the opposite thing? Close them down. I'm going to come to that in a second. Anachronisms. What is the left to do? Number one, become social democrats. Now, Ram Guha and I have had this conversation for years. Look, he says, the party is already social democratic. You basically were social democrats in West Bengal. Why don't you just become social democrats? Just give up the hammer and sickle. Give up the whole Lenin-Stalin thing. Recently, he wrote a piece in the Telegraph saying, you know, you should just adopt Bhagat Singh and forget all the foreign leaders. You know, because the BJP had just knocked down the Lenin statue. And so he said, you know, maybe he is a foreign person. Guys, the BJP and especially the RSS is inspired by like Hitler and Mussolini. You know, Munji went to Italy and studied fascist tactics from Munji. I mean, to my mind, Savarkar is a foreigner. Not to India, but to the planet Earth. So, I mean, why do you need Savarkar, like, paintings in the parliament? The other day I was talking to somebody, she was saying, have you read this book by God Bole? I said, are you joking? Read a book by God Bole? I mean, for what? Like, for some intellectual thing or to learn something? She was like, well, it's a very interesting book. Really? This guy killed Gandhi, man. Why would I read a book? Become social democrats, Ram says. And then, you know, you can build a, you can be the backbone of a new revival. Something to consider is that communism has a very slow, like a turtle, slow journey. It moves steadily. And it works confounded by the dialectic between the present and the future. See, this dialectic between the present and the future is something that I think one should consider. If you, as a political party, a communist party or a socialist party or whatever, some kind of transformative party that believes in a post-capitalist future, if you as this kind of party exceed too much to the present, there's a tendency to reformism. See, one of the interesting features is in our theory, in our understanding of how capitalism works, we don't find it credible that the dominant classes want to share wealth and power with everybody else. We don't find that a credible approach to human reality. We don't think that the dominant classes infected somehow by liberalism, are going to deliver to the poor and the you know, peasants and workers and so on a greater share of the surplus and say, why don't you also come in and govern with us? I mean, today I visited the picket lines at York. Why doesn't this administration, among whom I used to know some of these people personally, actually just come and negotiate with the students? Why do they demand that the students have to surrender before they negotiate? You see, what I'm saying is that you'd have to have a completely upside-down vision of reality if you believe that the ruling class, just nudged a little bit by liberalism or good feeling, is going to give up capital, give up power, you know, give up these things just to look nice and be considered as, you know, decent people. They're not decent people. They are advantaged by an indecent, immoral structure. So if you believe in a social democratic politics alone, then what happens is you are going to basically betray the workers and peasants who are part of your movement. Because they are not going to be able to get a better deal unless they struggle and fight and build power. So in a sense, exceeding too much to the present is what we consider class collaboration with the elite. And therefore the surrender of the demands, grievances, hopes, aspirations, of the working class people, peasants and so on, of our societies. At the same time, if you go too far into demanding questions of the future, that cuts the party off or any political organization from the struggles of the present. This is a demand for purism. Don't get stuck in the current dilemmas, you know, the desire to fight somehow to produce, say, an end to hunger. Don't get caught up in all this. You'll get stuck in the present. Just go for the future. This, will, this is what actually produces a tendency to sectarianism. I mean, one of the challenges of the left, which is why the left should not become social democratic, but why the left requires social democracy to grow. I can come back to that. Why I think for the left, it's very important to have a social democratic party in your society. If the left accedes to social democracy, if it gives up its belief in transformation, then you've gone beyond the dialectic between the present and the future. And the dialectic between the present and the future 
is really the essence of a political project of the left. Second, that was you know Ram's comment, become social democrat. Second, dissolve the vanguard and let the so-called people be free. Why do you need a vanguard? You know, I remember uh, when subordinate studies came out in 1982 and then thereafter, being very excited by the project, rethinking history. You know, everything was exciting. I mean, you're, that's the one thing about academics that I don't miss, by the way, this idea that everything has to be new. You've got to have the newest critique. You know, you can't repeat something from the past. You've got to be original. Good luck. Good luck with being original. Half the time when you hear somebody saying, I have an original argument, it's from 1935. <laughs> we also in this industry lose the capacity to be humble and understand how ideas grow and develop. And you know, sometimes we take U-turns in our thinking and so on. Subordinate studies showed up and it was really exciting. And then reading it, reading it, reading it, by the way, of course, it published that scoundrel Swapan Das Gupta and so on, you know, it's not a, all pure, by the way. Sapan Das Gupta, now chief ideologue of the BJP, has an essay in one of the subordinate studies, volumes four or five, on the peasant movement in Midnapur. You should go look it up. Should Xerox it and a thousand people should mail it to him. Although it's not a very good essay, but that's a separate issue. One of the things about subordinate studies that I found quite extraordinary was that there was no organization. The category organization was not available. In other words, it sort of promoted spontaneity, that movements just happen. If you go back and read the studies, you'll find that there are no organizers. In fact, Dil uh, Dipesh, in his stuff, attacked the idea of the organizer. You know, the Bhadralok coming from outside, etc. Somehow the idea was that the poor, the worker, makes history by, the work, by themselves. This is an interesting idea, because firstly it assumes that organization always comes from outside that workers don't self-organize into unions and so on, that these unions of the past were not organized by workers. They had to come from outside. It's not historically true. But it somehow assumed that organization is irrelevant. If you in the past suggest that struggles took place without the work of organization, then why should you organize in the present? What's the need of organizing? The way you construct a historical imagination has an immense impact on how people act in the world now. So the erasure of organization in the past strikingly mirrored the kind of postmodern thinking, you know, which was itself the mirror of Hayekian liberalism. You try to change the world, you'll go to the gulag. You know, a stunning vision of history that you should therefore not bother to try to change the world. Let the market change the world. It's a stunning indictment of thinking in that period when um, these volumes were coming out. Somehow there was a belief that spontaneity was good and rigidness was bad. This was the kind of duality. You know, there's a literature that's worked through the divide between spontaneity and organization. If nothing else, go and read Rosa Luxemburg's very ter terrific book, Reform and Revolution. It's a superb attack on Bernstein. But really, it's not an attack on Bernstein alone. This book underscores, goes into the problem of organization. She also wrote an essay called The Problem of Organization. Very fine essay. You know, those old Bolsheviks and socialism, they were struggling with the idea of organization and spontaneity. It's well worth going and revising, going and reading that stuff again, and thinking also honestly about how movements actually get built. Can they be changed without organization? Um, I remember uh, I was reporting during the Arab Spring from Egypt, and you know, everybody around all the Western press was celebrating that in Tahrir Square there was no organization that it was all just sort of happening. But it was obvious to us it was not without organization. There were the Muslim Brotherhood. If they hadn't been there, there would have been no defense against the, you know, the, essentially the gundas that came in to beat up people in the square. Then there were the liberal bloggers sitting in a corner with the computers on, with a kind of blue light shining in their faces. And then there were the young kids from the graveyards. You know, Cairo's a wild city. You have people just living their lives in graveyards. The slums, there are some slums in graveyards. And these young kids from the graveyards, very organized, were the ones fighting the cops. You know, they were the ones pelting the cops with stones and so on. Highly organized space, not disorganized at all, but organized by realities that were alien 
to the, these press people because they couldn't see these young kids as part of organized networks operating, you know, like swallows, you know, running in patterns, you know, understanding each other very well because they've done this stuff all the time. They've confronted the cops all the time. A book was written by an American journalist called Once Upon a Revolution in which he starts the book by attacking Leninist ideas of the vanguard and says that, you know, it's a great thing that in Egypt there was no vanguard. Then in the middle of the book, he says at one point when there's discussing the question of media definition of the revolution, there's a building in Cairo called Maspero, which is the headquarters of the media. And this very well-meaning liberal journalist writes, they should have seized Maspero. I asked him, who is they? Like, when you say they should have seized Maspero, who is they? Who gets to say, comrades, let's go seize Maspero? Like, how can you, who believe that it's good to have a revolution of the people without organization, suddenly come up upon reality where you say, if they had seized Maspero, they could have defined the revolution? But that takes a vanguard party, that takes somebody coming in there with a theory of revolution with revolutionaries who've been steeled in various forms of struggle, who understand, who can feel the temperature of a movement and say at that point, it's time to go to com stand up in the square and say, comrades of the, you know, of the graveyards, you lead the way because you are braver than we are. Go and fight us a corridor so we can seize Maspero. Or Muslim brother, you stand there in that statuesque way that you do, terrifies the cops and lead the way to seize Maspero, because there was nobody else really willing to do anything like that. Same thing in this long march of the Kisan Sabha. I mean, this was organized by the All India Kisan Sabha. This was not just farmers waking up one day. You know, it's like the myth of Rosa Parks in the United States. This old woman woke up one day and said, I'm not going to... She was trained at Highlander School. She was trained by organizers. They had practiced sitting on that damn bus and not moving. This was part of an organized campaign, friends. It's not like some one day this old woman was too tired. She's not even that old, actually, when she did it. She was quite young. She was a young militant, highly trained. Practice this because you need to practice it when you're sitting at a lunch counter in North Carolina and people come and throw their, you know, whatever is spaghetti on your head, throw a hamburger at your face. You have to be trained to be able to deal with that. Building a political movement is about training people, stealing them to know how to operate and not break down, not get violent in return, and so on. So this aspect of, oh, well, there was a long march. I'm like, I mean, on social media, people said, oh, why is the left claiming credit for it? It's OK, guys. Communism is not an abstract force. It is composed of individuals. People who have sacrificed their lives, given a great deal to build these movements, these platforms of the politics of the people. Between theory and practice, there is organization. When Lenin said, you cannot have a revolutionary theory without revolutionary practice, he might have added in, you cannot have either without the mediating concept of organization. Organization is what bridges theory and practice. These three concepts are essential to each other. You can't just have theory and practice. You've got to have an organization. It anchors um, this. <coughs> Number three. I'm going okay. Five. Yeah, five, six five, minutes. Yeah. Six minutes. Eight minutes. Okay. <laughs> I got a couple of stories. Third thing that I hear occasionally, why don't you dissolve the party and let identity movements develop? You know, caste movements, etc., religious movements, so on. I mean, it's really interesting. Ahilan uh, made a very important comment. Ahilan, when you said that the Jaffa, uh, Jaffa Youth Congress begins with anti-caste struggles, I mean, in a sense, it's impossible to imagine any class struggle in South Asian history that has not engaged caste, gender, you know, indigeneity. I mean, these are the ways in which class manifests itself in the world. Madiha said the same thing in her presentation, that class is expressed in society, through society. It doesn't, it's not like, you, there's no such thing as class. Class is an analytic understanding of power. People don't have a class, like they have an identity of, say, religion or so on. You know, class is something that you have experienced analytically. You experience it really, of course, poverty and so on. But class is at a different level. 
you know, it's the embodiment of various forms of suffering and consciousness together. It's Althusser has a very nice distinction between class for itself and class in itself. You know, it's not only your position in a class society, but it's your understanding of that as well. And your understanding of it always is refracted through religion, through various other identities, caste, through, you know, uh, you know gender, etc. Now, I remember doing a project in Tanjavur district, which had an amazing peasant struggle in the early part of the previous century. I was just collecting material like I do. I travel around India, collect stories, meet old comrades, ask them, tell me about the past, you know, that sort of thing. Not for any project. But they told a really nice story about Srinivas Rao, uh, K.M. Gopu, and later P. Ramamurthy. These are important names in Tamil Nadu's history. It means nothing to most of you. They arrived in Tanjavur, and you know, they had an understanding how to build an organization. So what they said, you know, they gave up their lives in uh, Madras and I think Madurai and came to this rural area where there had been some problems, drought problems, this, that, and the other. And Srinivas Rao said, well, we have to build a unit. You know, like every communist, you get the handbook, Foundations of Leninism or something. They say, well, we have to build a unit. And so he gathered some people who were interested in left ideas, uh, people who had uh, understood some things through their own struggles, peasant struggles, struggles for water and so on. And they formed a small unit there. And then he said, well, you know, the unit is spread out around the district, so we need a courier who's going to pass messages back and forth, you know. So there was a young man, he said, I'll be the courier, you know, I'm very interested. And he had a bicycle, which was useful. So one day, Srinivas Rao gives him a message and says, deliver it to the other side of the thing and come back. About eight, ten hours later, this guy came back. Srinivas Rao furious says to him, how could you take so long to go there and come back? You know, it's just a straight run. You should have delivered it, come back. What if it was an urgent thing? You know, we had to meet somewhere and fight the police or whatever. The guy says, listen, you don't understand this, but I'm a Dalit. And we're not allowed to ride our bicycles through the middle of town. We have to go all the way around and so on. So it took hours to get there. So Srinivas Rao, you know, who had not really fully understood and digested the question of Dalit humiliation was furious. You know, he said, well, we've got to do. So the first thing that their Kisan Sabha unit did was they fought against this bicycle prohibition. And they won on that. I mean, our histories are very complicated. You know, there is a very silly way in which we say, well, the left doesn't engage caste. Or the left doesn't do this, left doesn't do that. I mean, one has to actually go back and look at the experiences of these struggles. If you read Kathleen Guff's essays, very good essays, very fine essays. She was a Toronto-based, right? Canada. She did that book with, uh, what's his name, who died a few years ago. She was on the west coast of Canada. Yeah. Vancouver. Yeah. Isn't that the west coast? Yeah. UBC. Very fine anthropologist. I don't mean to uh, criticize her or anything, but in her work on Tanjavur, she wrote some amazing stuff. But this political thing was not in her work. So if you read Kathleen Guff to understand about Tanjavur, what you see is here were the distress signals, here was the peasant struggle, and there's no mention of this crucial component, which is that class had to be constructed through an anti-caste struggle. In the 1950s, B.R. Ambedkar, sits in his study and starts to draft a book called India and Communism. And he never finished this book. We published this in Leftward last year. Very fine, the remainder of the book. In this book, Ambedkar basically makes the point that in India you cannot create a communist movement unless you strike deeply at the root of caste. Caste struggle has to be essential in a class uh, to create a communist movement. But at the same time, you can't organize people on the ground of caste because you're not creating caste polarization politically. You don't want to create caste polarization. You don't want to create a caste war in a society. So interesting that in two adjoining districts in Tamil Nadu, one is East Tanjavur district and the other is just, just to its west, both had agrarian struggles. One was led by the communists in East Tanjavur. They won a major struggle against the landlords. The other one, which was led by the forward bloc, degenerated into a caste war, where there were basically riots, inter-caste riots that lasted for a generation. You know, we published another book at Leftward about that district called Murder in Mudulikat Mudulikataram. Uh, very fine book. 
So a very detailed study about that. These are adjoining districts, two different strategies. If you want to risk organizing on the platform of caste, to strengthen caste as a platform, that risk is substantial because it can move to a caste war. This is what they worried about. Now, it took them in Tamil Nadu, I'm emphasizing Tamil Nadu, because about 20 years ago in Tamil Nadu, there was a serious move to organize against untouchability. It was found by the Kisan Sabha, also by the Democratic Youth Federation and the All India Women's Democratic Association, Edwa. It was found that they could not advance any struggles unless they directly hit untouchability. This is Ambedkar's lesson. It was many years coming, but it has come, deeply come. So the CPIM organized in Tamil Nadu, the Tamil Nadu Untouchability Eradication Front. And what this front does is it goes into villages, organizes people in the village, and then gives people the confidence. You see, this is the key thing for organizing. Organizing provides a platform of confidence. People might have consciousness, they might have the willingness, but sometimes the confidence to act is just not there. That has been my experience as well in understanding how peasant struggles develop. Con confidence plays an immense role. It can be, of course, self-generated and often is, but it doesn't help, I'm sorry, it doesn't hurt to have outside forces, parties, etc., come in and provide the scaffolding for one's confidence. And then people in those villages have been going and knocking down the so-called caste wall or the untouchable wall. I mean, these are horrible walls built in the middle. It's like an apartheid wall in these villages in Tamil Nadu. So the Tamil Nadu Untouchability Eradication Front has been going from village to village, organizing people against these caste walls. What this has done, in a sense, is provided now a much better buoyancy for the Kisan Sabha, that is the Farmers and Agricultural Workers uh, Unit. Finally, last point. You see, there are some things that I want us to think about. These are serious, these four things are serious challenges for the production of a new left horizon. It's not that the left isn't in a serious problem globally. So I want you to think about these four different challenges posed before us. One is that the working class and the peasantry has been seriously decomposed. I mean, if you've traveled to rural India now, you will find women and men, but mostly women, spending five, six hours a day commuting to places where they are not guaranteed to get daily labor. They are day laborers, commuting five, six hours to get to the point where they might get rejected, two and a half hours to get there, two and a half hours. There's no time for them to be in organizations. They are basically at the edge of survival. This decomposition of the working class, the construction of basically makiladoras within India, you know, on the corridor, not only in the Gurgaon belt, you know, Manesar, that area, but between Madras and Coimbatore, in, Bang in the north of Bangalore, that road that goes north. I mean, these are new belts of essentially makiladoras where workers brought from, say, Bihar to Karnataka are kept in compounds. And they work there, and then they are sent by bus back to Bihar. It's very hard to organize in these spaces where essentially factories have become prisons. So this recomposition of the working class is a serious challenge. The Indian left, that is both the you know, so-called mainstream or whatever you want to call it, communist parties, have taken seriously the idea that we, if we cannot organize at the point of production, we have to organize at the point of life. In other words, where people live in slums, huge project organizing in slums, organizing people in their home places when they come back home and then they go to their factories and so on. It's a very long-term project. It's not going to bear dividends, as they say in uh, capitalist concern, for a long time. I mean, this idea that we're shifting some of our resources from building factory-based organizings to building working-class organization in urban areas, in rural areas where people live, is a very serious project to try to recompose the decomposed working class. That was the first challenge. Second challenge, you know, this is what Prithu was saying today about the new aspirations, what I began with as well. You know, we have to consider how to both reveal what is being concealed by this phase of capitalism, the concealing of the fact that we labor socially, accumulation is private, and then all this immense production of desire 
through ad advertisements, media, etc., basically conceals reality from people. I don't mean this is false consciousness, by the way. It's not that debate. This is an entirely different situation. This is a situation of how new aspirations are created. People believe in the new aspirations. How do we create socialist aspirations? You know, what is this going to look like? What is a new national or international popular will going to look like? This is a serious challenge, not for this party, that party, that group, this non-party. All those divides are irrelevant here. This is a serious challenge for the totality of the left. Se thirdly, we have a challenge for a new social welfare project. You know, if we have the dialectic between the present and the future, what kind of social welfare project can we envision? You know, do we come back to make greater demands for social wages? In other words, rather than demand individual wage rises, which is basically a neoliberal way to demand higher payment, do we demand more social wages, improvement of healthcare systems, improvement of, you know, uh, uh, of, uh, of educational systems? We have to think very carefully about what people have, you know, what the best practice has shown in struggle. You know, whether it's in Chhattisgarh, where they've built these community hospitals, whether it's in you know, uh, the Cuban experience, whether it's people like uh, Camilo Harry from Honduras and the ideas that they have of interesting new ways of delivering health care, basic health care to people. We have to be very imaginative about new forms of social welfare, including education. You know, what kind of education systems do we want to fight for? Is it enough to always fight rearguard actions? You know, there are a million student struggles going on now, including at York, but Jawaharlal Nehru University this week, there was a long march from, the, from JNU to Parliament Street. They were beaten mercilessly by Delhi police. These are rearguard actions. What's the new thinking? What should education look like? How do we appeal to people, going back to point two, with new aspirations? You know, we can't just say that they can't deliver. What have we decided you know, could become a way in which society works. I've never found comfortable that idea that, you know, all the solutions are once you take power. You've got to think about these things in the present. It's the dialectic between the present and the future. Finally, we have to think about leisure. You know, we have to make demands on leisure. It sounds insane to say it. You know, 100 years ago, they had the 8-hour, 10-hour day, then the 8-hour day. I think it's about time we actually captured for people as a slogan the idea of a four-hour day or a three-hour day. You know, we don't work. Socialists don't demand that life is about work. That's a fascist slogan. Arbeit Mark Frey. That's what the Nazis put in Treblinka. You know, that's Auschwitz. That's not our slogan. Our slogan is we live as human beings to create community with other human beings. I don't give two shits if you work 20 hours or eight hours. Or, you should work less. You need to spend more time building society. We need to spend more time with each other as people. Those simple demands need to be at the heart of our movement, of our project. You know? We need to fight against capitalism, which is basically anti-life, and project ourselves as a life-giving force, not just as a negative force against capitalism. So that's a fi final point for that. All of this, in my opinion, would help us build a new horizon. I mean, that's the real point, is that in a sense, in July of 1991, when Manmohan Singh wrote this text with American spellings, or in Silampur, when this gangster shot himself with heroin, these were anti-life openings. Life seemed to end in these openings. Something toxic entered the world, as far as I was concerned. Our movement has suffered a huge blow, huge defeat, not just politically, but also intellectually. You know, universities uh, are places where people make it an industry to think critically about the left, which is already a weak force. Instead of putting the intelligence to work to help reimagine what a left project would be like. It's tiresome to hear, you know, talk after talk about the left hasn't done this, the left hasn't done that. I would like intelligent people to put their intelligence forward to think about some of the complex problems we face today and to posit at least some sorts of, for discussion even, answers to these problems. So come on guys, let's get it together. You want the left, the point isn't to have the left be perfection. The point is to pr produce movements where we're thinking together to build that new horizon. Thanks a lot.